Just have a couple things at the top before we get going. Uh, President Biden, uh, today he called Taoiseach Leo Varadkar of Ireland uh, to recognize his years of service as a leader of Ireland and of the good relationship they have developed. Having recently celebrated St. Patrick's Day at the White House, the leaders reflected on their cooperation over the years on shared priorities, particularly deepening U.S.-Ireland ties between our people and our economies. They noted recent progress in Northern Ireland with the restoration of its executive and assembly, reaffirming the critical role these institutions play in preserving the gains of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. The president conveyed that he looks forward to continuing to build a vibrant future for U.S. Rela Irish relations with the new Taoiseach once elected by the Irish Parliament. Additional news from this morning. As, a, as part of President Biden's Investing in America agenda, today our administration announced the single largest investment in industrial decarbonization in our nation's history. The Department of Energy will provide $6 billion for 33 projects across more than 20 states, reduce industrial greenhouse gas emissions, revitalize industrial communities, strengthen the nation's manufacturing competitiveness, and support good-paying union jobs. With this investment, the Biden-Harris administration will spur the next generation of decarbonization technologies and keep America's key industries competitive. I want to turn to two pieces of news looking ahead to Tuesday. First, the Supreme Court will hear oral argument in the administration's appeal of the Fifth Circuit decision on mifeprestone, a drug used in medication abortion that the FDA first approved as safe and effective over 20 years ago. This administration will continue to stand by FDA's independent approval and regulation of mifeprestone as safe and effective. And we will continue to fight back against unprecedented attacks on women's freedom to make their own health decisions. As the Department of Justice continues defending the FDA's actions before the Supreme Court, President Biden, Vice President Harris remain firmly committed to defending women's ability to access reproductive care and they will continue to urge Congress to pass a law restoring the protections of Roe v. Wade. Finally, I want to briefly preview tomorrow's travel. President Biden and Vice President Harris will head north to North Carolina to discuss the administration's vision for the future. On the other hand, Republican elected officials are proposing a very different vision for the nation. Last week, Republican Study Committee released a budget which uh, proposes devastating cuts to Medicare, to Social Security, and Affordable Care Act. It would increase prescription drug, energy, and housing costs, all while forcing tax giveaways for the very rich. Tomorrow's trip is an opportunity to contrast those visions, and we'll be sure to have more to share with you on this trip as well. With that, my colleague Admiral J John Kirby is here to discuss Israel and the UN uh, Security Council resolution that you all are covering today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, as you all know, we abstained on a UN Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza till the end of Ramadan and the release of all the hostages. Our vote does not, I repeat, does not represent a shift in our policy. We've been very clear, we've been very consistent in our support for a ceasefire as part of a hostage deal. That's how the hostage deal is structured, and the resolution acknowledges the ongoing talks. We wanted to get to a place where we could support this resolution, but because the final text does not have key language that we think is essential, such as condemning Hamas, we couldn't support it. Though, because it does fairly reflect our view that a ceasefire and the release of hostages come together, we abstained. Uh, Defense Minister Gallant uh, is here today meeting with uh, Mr. Sullivan. In fact, as we speak, uh, he'll have other meetings uh, while he's in town uh, today and tomorrow, uh, certainly with uh, Secretary of Defense Austin uh, tomorrow. Um, and uh, and so we certainly look forward to having those discussions with him um, and making it clear to the defense minister that the United States continues to stand with Israel as they fight Hamas uh, and will continue to work with might and main to get those hostages back with their families where they belong. Thank you.
John, what was the president's reaction to the decision by Netanyahu not to send an Israeli delegation this week? I got to tell you, Steve, we're, um, we're, we're, we're kind of perplexed by this. Um, a couple of points that need to be stated and, in fact, restated. Number one, it's a non-binding resolution, so there's no impact at all on Israel and Israel's ability to continue to go after Hamas. Um, number two, as I said in my opening statement, it does not represent a change at all in our policy. It's very consistent with everything that we've been saying we want to get done here. And we get to decide what our policy is. The Prime Minister's office seems to be indicating through public statements that we somehow changed here. We haven't. And we get to decide what, uh, what our policy is. Uh, it seems like the Prime Minister's office is choosing to create a perception of daylight here when they don't need to do that. Um, so again, no change in our policy. What does this do to the relationship between the President and Prime Minister Netanyahu? I have no doubt that the two leaders will uh, have follow-on discussions as they have as appropriate throughout uh, this conflict. Uh, thank you. You say it's not a shift in policy uh, by voting for this today. Get specific with us as to why again, and to the charge that by even abstaining, because normally there may be some attempt at the Security Council or the UN overall to condemn Israel every so often for whatever reason, and the U.S. usually stands up and vetoes those resolutions. Here now, for the first time in a while, the United States is at least abstaining and allowing it to go through. So the perception broadly is that the U.S. is no longer got Israel's back when it comes to conversations like this with the U.S. Yeah, that's just not true, Ed. Nothing could be further from the truth, quite frankly. Of course we still have Israel's back. I mean, as you and I are speaking, we are still providing tools and capabilities, weapon systems, so that Israel can defend itself against which we, we, we agree is still a viable threat uh, to Hamas. Again, no change by this non-binding resolution on what Israel can or cannot do in terms of defending itself. Um, but, you know, the other day, Friday when I was up here, Brian was asking me about, you know, how, how come it was okay for, or, or not okay for Russia and China to veto a resolution that we drafted on Friday uh, when we vetoed similar ones prior uh, to it. And, and I, my answer then is going to be my answer today because of the substance of it. The ones we vetoed didn't condemn Hamas. This one didn't condemn Hamas, which is why we couldn't support it. But we didn't veto it because, in general, unlike previous res resolutions, this one did fairly capture what has been our consistent policy, which is linking a hostage deal and the release of those men and women with, of course, uh, uh, a temporary ceasefire. There are U.S. officials today saying Netanyahu's acting this way because he's facing some domestic political pressure. There's domestic political issues going on. Aren't there also domestic political pressures facing President Biden? And that's part of the reason why y'all are allowing this to happen today? I, I can't speak yeah. for... Members of the Democratic Party saying he's doing this wrong. You have the general public suggesting his support for Israel is in his place. Is that part of why this is going through? No, no, absolutely not. And I got to take issue with the premise of the question. The President makes decisions based on the national security interests of the United States. Uh, and this decision to abstain on this resolution is in keeping with the national security interests of the United States. And quite frankly, it's in keeping with the national security concerns of the Israeli people. The Customs and Border Policy, or Border Patrol chief yesterday suggested in an interview um, that the situation at the southern border is a national security threat because of the roughly 140,000 known gotaways, or those that crossed the border and were detected as crossing illegally. Is that the position of the whole Biden administration of the White House, that the situation down there remains a national security The president threat? has spoken to this. I mean, he's talked about the, the urgent need for additional funding for uh, key capabilities at the border. And if you care about the border, if you care about the security of the border, and the president sure does, then we ought to get that national security supplemental passed. That's what that funding will do. Uh, you, there's only so much that you can do through executive action. In order to get more resources to prevent more people from getting in illegally, you got to have funding. But a national security threat is going a little further than the broad concerns of the president, and more specific. DHS monitors uh, all available intelligence at the border every single day, Ed. We're certainly aware uh, that, uh, that there could be national security threats that can arise at the border, which is why we're, we're arguing so hard to get additional resources and capabilities down there. 
Uh, two questions on Israel. Um, I know you said earlier today that the meetings with uh, Defense Minister Gallant weren't necessarily supposed to be a replacement for the for the delegation that was supposed to come here this week. But how much of those conversations with senior officials naturally become about alternatives to Rafa? What the intent of the meeting was supposed to be this week? Well, I also said I fully expect that Rafa will come up in the context of these conversations, the one he's having with Jake right now. Uh, I think he's going over to the State Department this afternoon and, of course, at the Defense Department tomorrow. Absolutely, I think we'll have an opportunity to talk about uh, Rafa, but, uh, but, um, but uh, it, it probably won't be a full replacement for what we we're hoping to do with a, a broader, larger delegation of Israeli counterparts. That said, and I also said earlier today, uh, that um, just because this meeting is now not going to happen doesn't mean that we aren't still going to look for uh, an avenue and an approach to be able to share those alternatives with the Israelis. And following up on what Steve asked, doesn't this, speak, doesn't this whole episode speak to a pretty poor state of relations between U.S. and Israel right now? And is it, how much is the president losing his ability to influence Bibi Netanyahu with everything that's happening? Israel is still a close ally and a friend. The defense minister is here as we speak, just in the other room. Uh, we still have a very close relationship with, uh, with our Israeli partners uh, and with the government in place. Uh, as we've said many times, it doesn't mean we're going to agree on everything, and by goodness, we don't. Uh, but that's what friends can do. You can disagree. You can have those conversations. But, you know, we all recognize how important it is that Israel still be able to defend itself. At the same time, making sure that humanitarian assistance is getting in, civilian casualties come down, and we get those hostages out. Thanks, Admiral. Just following on that question, how would you characterize the relationship in specific between Netanyahu and President Biden since he didn't call President Biden to notify him about the cancellation of this delegation visit? Is their relationship at a new low? I wouldn't describe it that way at all. Uh, I, I don't really have much more to add. I think I got the same question on Friday. Uh, these are two leaders who have known each other for going on now four decades. And they haven't in the past agreed on everything, and they don't agree on everything right now. But they both agree on one really important thing, and that is the importance of the state of Israel, the importance of the security of the Israeli people, the importance of making sure that an attack like the 7th of October doesn't happen again. But is the president concerned about that Rafa invasion now moving forward in a way he doesn't want it to since he's not able to have this? We, see, we have the same concerns about a major ground offensive in Rafa that we had yesterday and the day before. And just lastly, an administration official said there could be domestic political reasons for why Netanyahu responded in the way he did. Could you elaborate on what those domestic issues in Israel could be? No. Admiral, is it your expectation that uh, the defense minister has with him the kind of operational details you've been looking for on a potential Rafa mission? Do you think he possesses that, and would that likely come up in uh, in the meeting? Oh, he's look, he's in, 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 in the, at the top of the chain of command of the Israeli Defense Forces, so we're quite certain that he has enough visibility on what their thinking is about Rafa to be able to share that if, if he chooses to. Does the president feel the delay of this other delegation meeting uh, that he wanted? Is there a sense that there is an urgency in terms of lives when you're considering humanitarian crisis we've talked about, potential for military operation? Does he view this kind of a delay on that sort of meeting as potentially causing much further harm uh, to those in Gaza or this very delicate situation? Well, there's two ways to approach that. I mean, one is um, we haven't seen any indication that the Israelis are imminently getting ready to conduct a ground operation in Rafah. And we have not seen their plans for that, operational plans for that. So there's no, just to be clear, there's no sense right now that uh, this is about to happen in coming days. Um, now, when it would happen is, of course, be up to the Israelis. But so just in terms of timing, it seems like it, it, they're, they're a ways off here from actually moving into Rafah. That said, does the president feel a sense of urgency about the suffering in Gaza? Absolutely, which is why we've been pushing so hard to get additional crossings open, get more trucks in, even, even while we're negotiating for a hostage deal, still trying to do everything we can to improve the humanitarian situation on the ground, continuing to do airdrops. Um, now we're, you know, we've got this temporary pier that's at sea, moving its way over to the Mediterranean as, as we speak today. Uh, the president's put a lot of energy and effort and made the team put a lot of energy into effort uh, and effort into alleviating that stuff. Suffering. Yes, there is a keen sense of urgency. Uh, thank Sorry. you, Admiral. Now that the Israelis have canceled this visit, is the U.S. moving closer toward withholding or conditioning weapons to Israel? Is that something that Secretary Austin might raise during his meeting with the defense, Israeli Defense Minister tomorrow? Uh, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals and, uh, uh, and speculate about that one way or the other. 
Why does the administration believe that the right path for the U.S. here is to conduct these airdrops to build this pier, but not to leverage everything it can, including conditions on weapons to open up more land routes and better protect civilians in Gaza? We have, I, I would take issue with this idea that we're not leveraging everything we can. First of all, it's not a leveraging exercise. It's not about uh, uh, trying to, to, uh, to use some sort of power dynamics here with our good friend and ally Israel. It's about helping them defend themselves. I, I think we need to remember what happened on the 7th of October. Number two, uh, from the very beginning, uh, we have at the same time, as we've been providing them the capabilities, we've also been able to influence some of their decisions on the ground and the, some of the way they have prosecuted operations, and in, including increasing the amount of humanitarian assistance that gets in. It's not enough. I recognize that. A lot more needs to be done. Uh, but we believe you can do both at the same time, and that's the approach that we've been taking. Uh, uh, John, on this um, resolution that the U.S. abstained for, uh, abstained to today, that uh, was within the power of the United States to block, um, the Prime Minister said it gives Hamas hope the international pressure will allow them to accept a ceasefire without the release of our hostages. Is he wrong? Yes. Uh, does the U.S. still have leverage to change language of future resolutions now that this language, without the Hamas component, has been put into place? Well, let's see. I mean, there's just, just voted on this non-binding resolution today. I don't know of additional text that's coming, but we'll take each one in turn. Uh, and quickly on the border, is the administration still considering executive action on the border? I don't have any announcements to make with respect to executive action. I would remind that the, you know this, uh, this argument that the president hasn't taken executive action or, or, or is just not true. He has kept American troops down there at the border. He has worked uh, as commander in chief with the government of Mexico to, to improve their ability to, to try to stem that flow uh, and to go after uh, uh, fentanyl traffickers. I mean, it's not as if he hasn't, but there is a real limit that what really needs to be done, if you really care about the border, uh, and stem in the flow is additional resources. And the president can't just sign those into being. You got to have funding behind that. You have to have a checking account for that. And that comes from the power of the person. That comes from Capitol Hill. So is there nothing more that he can do outside of I'm not going to get into uh, anything more he would or wouldn't do. I certainly won't get ahead of the president's decision space on this. But the idea that he hasn't taken executive action when warranted is just not true. He has. But there is a real limit to executive action in terms of what's needed down there. What's needed is funding more than anything. And again, for all the people out there uh, expressing concerns about the border, number one, we share those concerns, which is why the president put you know, billions of dollars into a, a national security supplemental to give the border patrol, to give the customs courts uh, additional resources. You got to have funding for that. Some of these meetings are proceeding this week. Can you help us understand what the American position, what the alternative is? What would, what would you have suggested to the Israelis? Well, because I think we're going to still continue to try to have those conversations. I'm going to let those conversations happen before announcing it from the podium. Can you tell people when those conversations might happen? Are these through the regular channels? I wish I could. Or is there hope of talks happening? I wish I, could, I wish I could right now. But, I mean, this decision just happened in the last couple of hours, so we're going to have to see where it goes. And is there any circumstance that the U.S. would support a ROP operation in the future? Are you ruling it out entirely, or are you ruling it out? I think we've been very clear. We don't believe that a major ground operation in Rafa is the right course of action, particularly when you have a million and a half people there seeking refuge and no conceived plan, no verifiable plan, to take care of them. We've been very consistent on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, on the non-binding thing, the UN Secretary General said after the vote, this resolution must be implemented. You say it's non-binding, so who is right here? And if it's non-binding, if, as you say, it does not change anything, why has the administration blocked so many pretty similar resolutions in the past? Because they didn't condemn Hamas. I've said that repeatedly. It doesn't condemn Hamas either. Because they didn't government. condemn Hamas and because they also just called for a ceasefire with no linkage to the hostages. This one, the reason why we can't support it but didn't veto it is because it does link hostages and a ceasefire, which is in keeping with our policy. And on the binding thing, is it binding, non-binding? It's a non-binding resolution. Thank you, John. Steve asked this question earlier, but what was the president's personal reaction to the Israeli de delegation canceling their trip, given that he had personally requested that they make this trip to Washington? I have not talked to him.
to the president, so I don't have his personal reaction. Okay. Um, on the UN Security Council resolution, if there were to be language added to it, updated to it, that condemns Hamas, would the U.S. support that resolution? Is that what you were saying? pretty speculative, MJ. I don't know if I can go there. I mean, this one just passed. As I said, it's a non-binding resolution. I don't know of any additional text that's coming up before the Security Council, so I don't want to get ahead of where we are right now. Well, you were specific about the language and the reasons in the past for vetoing it and now just abstaining from it, so I'm just wondering if the language were to be updated to... I know of no plans to update the language that was just passed this morning. So again, we'd have to, if, if, if additional text gets brought before the council, then I guess we'll have to examine it like we do every time. But I don't think it would be a useful exercise to speculate on language that doesn't exist right now. And then just um, finally on the um, ground incursion into Rafa and talking about alternatives to that, are U.S. officials basically envisioning, you know, highly precise, targeted military operations as opposed to a major military operation? Can you just talk to us a little bit, even if it's in broad strokes, about what the administration believes is possible that is an alternative to a ground incursion into Rafa? Um, the way I would put it is that based on our own experience going after terrorist networks, places like Iraq and Afghanistan, Somalia, um, places in the Sahel as well. Um, we, we feel like we've learned a lot of key lessons. Now, you, you know, not everyone applies to Gaza. Gaza is a unique environment. You've got uh, meters and meters of tunnels under the ground. You've got a much more ur urban environment, very densely populated, small geographic space. So you got to be careful in terms of apples and oranges here. But we still believe that we have learned some key lessons about how to dismantle a terrorist network, how to decapitate its leadership, how to starve it of resources, how to put pressure on its fighters um, uh, on the battlefield. And we were looking forward to, and I think still are looking forward to having the opportunity to share some of those lessons and perspectives with the Israelis. Now, what exactly that would look like, I'd really rather not go into it from the podium. But that's the kind of idea that we can expect U.S. officials to discuss with their Israeli counterparts. I mean, even today with Minister Broadly Obama. speaking, yes. And, and, and uh, we'll see what the conversations with the defense minister look like here. Again, he's talking to Jake right now, so we'll have a readout of that, of course. Um, and he's, again, more discussions over the next uh, day and a half. Uh, we'll obviously expect the, a key part of these discussions is going to be how we're going to continue to support Israel. So let's not forget that. I mean, this was a pre-scheduled, long-scheduled trip by the defense minister, largely to talk about how the United States is going to continue to support Israel and the tools that they need. But I certainly would envision in the context of what happened this morning uh, with the Israelis canceling that delegation that we'll take advantage of the opportunity to also talk about Rafa. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank, no, you. Oh, thank you. Has the, prime, has the president spoken to the prime <coughs> minister today, and does he have any plans to? No, and I don't know. Okay. And will he join any of these meetings now with Gallant, given the rate, the, the latest um, that's happened? I know of no plan to have him join the meetings with Defense Minister Gallant. Okay, and then finally, before the meeting with Jake Sullivan today, uh, the Defense Minister, he stood out in front of the White House, he delivered a statement, he said, we will operate against Hamas everywhere, including in places where we have not been, end quote. So it seems that they expect to discuss Rafa as well. What leads you to believe that they're open to these other alternatives that you're laying out or that the U.S. could even walk them off of an operation there? Well, they had agreed to come to send a delegation to, to Washington, D.C. a week or so ago. That expressed some interest. Uh, they canceled the meeting because of what happened at the U.N., but uh, our indications at, working at, at the working level uh, are, are that they are interested in hearing our perspectives. So we'll see. Thank you. I have a technical question and another question. On the technicality, you said the resolution is not binding. Is it non-binding or is it binding but not enforceable and no consequences for Israel, for example, if they don't abide by the ceasefire? My understanding is a non-binding resolution. resolution. Okay. Are you aware of uh, reports that uh, Palestinian women uh, were sexually harassed and some even were raped in the Shifa hospital by the Israeli army? And have you seen also videos of uh, Israeli drones uh, targeting civilians in Khan Yunis? And if you're not aware of these uh, incidents? I, I'm not. I've, uh, this is the first I'm hearing of that. Uh, I mean, the, if you those want are troubling to... allegations, obviously, troubling reports. Yeah. Um, the so State I'll, Department confirmed I, one of let, them. Let me take the question back. Okay, please. See if we can get you a better response.
Uh, oh, uh, thank you, uh, Admiral Kirby. Um, uh, a member of the Israeli War Cabinet, Ben Gantz, um, essentially um, broke with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu over his decision to pull back this delegation. He said that the delegation should come, and in addition to that, he said that Prime Minister Netanyahu himself should come and meet with uh, President Biden. What's your reaction to that, and is there a sense that the War Cabinet is not unified as it was? Previously? That's the first I'm hearing uh, that Minister Gantz uh, made that remark. Um, I would certainly respect his desire to, uh, his right to speak to his comments uh, one way or the other. Um, as I said a couple of hours ago, it's disappointing. Obviously, we would have preferred to have that meeting here this week uh, to talk about viable alternatives, and as I think I mentioned it. Josh, we're going to continue to look for an opportunity to have those conversations going forward. I can't speak to the dynamics on the War Cabinet. That's really for them to speak to. I wouldn't get into that. When it comes to you characterizing their decision as disappointing and perplexing, is there also a sense of offense of being offended by the Israelis' decision to pull back uh, this delegation? A lot of countries would, would love to have an invitation from the White House to have a meeting. <laughs> I think I'm just going to leave it the way I described it. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, until Recently, uh, when I or one of my colleagues here asked if the U.S. would consider withholding military aid to Israel if they don't allow uh, humanitarian aid into Gaza, you said that the administration would always make sure that Israel has the right to, has what it needs to defend itself. Uh, now, you are saying in response to those same questions that you will not get into hypotheticals. Uh, should we read anything into that, that now this is something that is being considered or discussed within the administration that it is now uh, a hypothetical being batted about uh, back behind you in, in those rooms? You, I, I, the short answer to your question is no, you shouldn't read anything more into it than what I'm, than what I'm expressing. Um, even as we speak, the defense minister for Israel is just a few steps away meeting with our national security advisor in a, in a long scheduled meeting, which was in part designed to talk about what we can continue to do to help Israel defend itself against a still viable threat. You can still do that. You can still have those conversations. You can still provide those capabilities at the same time, disagreeing with your good friend and ally about things like civilian casualties, humanitarian assistance, and where things are going up in New York City. So we're gonna continue to have those talks, but I, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm just not gonna get into the parlor game of what tripwire would be in place or what we would consider a tripwire in order to, to change the way we're supporting Israel in the field. And on uh, the subject of humanitarian aid, uh, last week the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, said that uh, he was blaming Israel directly for uh, the hunger crisis in, in Gaza because uh, arbitrary denials were keeping uh, food and uh, other humanitarian goods from getting into Gaza. Uh, is the provision of aid into Gaza something that uh, Mr. Sullivan is discussing with uh, Mr. Gallant right now, and how urgent is it that Israel uh, stop what the Foreign Secretary described as uh, arbitrary denials? Yes, humanitarian assistance will be on the agenda in Jake's meeting, and I suspect in the other meetings that the Defense Minister will have. We need Israeli, Israeli support um, and um, facilitation of humanitarian assistance. They're a critical player in this. They have a real key role to play, and, uh, and, and uh, we're going to continue to urge them to do more to allow more humanitarian assistance in. And, and one last thing. You, you just now uh, talked about how you weren't going to describe tripwires uh, that would potentially stop the provision yeah, so of call them red lines defense too. assistance. Uh, that's true. Have, people have called them red lines before. Uh, but the fact that you are not going to discuss them should we uh, inf should we infer that they now exist somewhere on some uh, paper uh, I, or in some memo or proposal? Again, I, I appreciate the effort, and I understand where the question is going. I, I'm just simply not going to engage in that kind of speculative talk. We are still providing Israel the capabilities they need to defend themselves. That is one of the reasons why the defense minister is here. Uh, and at the same time, we're having conversations with the Israelis about what they can do to increase humanitarian assistance. I want to go back just real quickly, and I apologize, Green, but on the humanitarian assistance, let, let's also not forget that, that Hamas chose to break a ceasefire that was in place on the 6th of October. They, they precipitated the conflict, and they continue to hide behind civilians. 
in civilian infrastructure, including in hospitals. Um, and they know exactly what they're doing. So while, yes, there are things that the Israelis can and should do more to get more trucks and humanitarian assistances, Hamas could solve all these problems right now by putting down their arms, letting all those hostages go. Okay, John, last question. Thanks, Corrine. John, you made a, a point throughout the briefing uh, about mentioning that this was a non-binding resolution that the U.S. abstained on. Last week's resolution that the U.S. brought forward, was that binding or non-binding? I, I have to get an answer for you and go back, go back on that. I, I, don't I, know that answer. I don't have that answer for you, but I'll take the question and I'll get back to you. And if it was binding or non-binding, why would it matter? Why would that matter? Why, why is that important in terms of that resolution that the U.S. put forward last well, week? Well, let me get an answer for you, and then I'll answer the second one as well. Okay, and then one additional thing. With the resolution that the U.S. put forward last week, why couldn't the U.S. have put that same resolution forward a week before or a month before? Because Why? we were working with previous texts that previous countries were putting forward to try to get them into a better place. You know, it wasn't like, you know, it's not, it's not like y'all don't, this, this language doesn't just get cooked up and thrown onto the Security Council floor in, in a matter of 30 minutes. It's usually worked over time. And we were working with the authors and other countries to try to get the language into a better place. And when we couldn't, we were left with no alternative but to veto. In this case, we chose to abstain because it didn't mention anything about Hamas, but yet because it, it did reflect our policy view that a hostage deal has to be linked to a ceasefire. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Someone on Ukraine. Uh, Speaker Johnson said last week that, quote, there is a big distinction in the minds of a lot of people referring to members of this conference between lethal and lethal aid for Ukraine and the humanitarian component. Now, I know the White House's preference is obviously to get the Senate passed package uh, passed by the House, but is there any consideration in the White House to just focus on delivering lethal aid to Ukraine if that's what can get a majority in the House? I mean, look, the National Security Supplemental, as it is, could get a majority in the House. That's what we know. We understand that to be true. It can get an overwhelming support, which means it includes Republicans as well as Democrats, if it just got put to the floor. I think what's happening is the Speaker's giving an excuse uh, that is not warranted, that is not needed, because we know that if, it, if he were to put it on the floor, it would, it would get through. And so uh, that's why I'm not even going to take that, really dive into that question, because he's bypassing what we understand, right? 7029 coming out of the coming out of the Senate. That's a bipartisan, overwhelming bipartisan majority in the Senate. And we know, we're hearing from Republicans uh, in the House, we know where Democrats, majority of Democrats stand, that if he were to put it on the floor, it would get support. So that is the facts. That is how we see it. We, incur we would encourage and continue uh, to encourage to speak Speaker Johnson to put that bill on the floor. And um, Chairman McCall was on the show yesterday talking about how the Speaker has made has has made it clear that he would move on this after the Easter break. And does the White House have any specific commitments from Speaker Johnson on moving on Ukraine aid in whatever iteration? So I can't speak to uh, commitments. What I can speak to uh, agreements, right, from the from even when the, the big four met uh, with the president not too long ago, earlier this year, that the understanding that we needed to move forward with this uh, this aid for Ukraine, we need to move forward with the national security supplemental. That was an understanding among them. Uh, they agreed with the president and the vice president. And so that's what we want to see. I can't speak to their timeline. We want this to happen right away, right away. Uh, the, we originally put this forward back in October of last year. And so uh, there's a need. We see what's happening as we were talking about Ukraine specifically in your first question to me. We see what's happening in Ukraine. They're losing ground in, on the battlefield. And that is because, partly because, uh, why Russia has been even more aggressive is because of the inaction of Congress. And that's what we see. That's what the CIA director told the big four not too long ago, right here in the White House. So 
he, they need to move forward. It is about our national security, uh, just as we're talking about aid to Ukraine, but it is also about our own national security. It's all connected here. Okay, so. Thanks, Karine. If the Supreme Court decides to restrict access to Mifepris Stone, what will the president do? What options does this White House have to ensure access to the abortion pill? So, look, I'm not going to uh, get into hypotheticals. I want to be super mindful here. We uh, have confidence uh, in our arguments before the court. Uh, and uh, and so there's a DOJ obviously ongoing litigation. I just mentioned at the top, it's going to be, uh, it's going to you know, it's going to be a process that's going to begin tomorrow. So I want to be super mindful. Don't want to get into hypotheticals. But the president and the vice president have been very clear. We're going to continue uh, to certainly. Um, uh, defend FDA's approval. It is independent. It uses science. Uh, it is uh, it is a medication, as I said at the top, that has been around when you think of amethyst for more than two decades. Uh, and uh, this is science based. This is science based. Uh, as FDA, when they move forward on these types of uh, uh, scientific judgment, if you will, but not going to get into hypothetical hypotheticals. Uh, and uh, we have confidence in our arguments. And Russia continues to indicate without evidence that Ukraine played some kind of role in the terror attack. Just how worried is the White House about that and the use, Russia using that to justify its war in Ukraine? Uh, look, we've been very clear. You heard, our, you, you, heard you saw our statement from over the weekend. Uh, this was a, a terrorist attack. Uh, that was conducted by ISIS. Mr. Putin understands that. He knows that very well. And uh, look, it is there is absolutely no evidence that the government of Ukraine had anything to do with this attack. We've been very clear about that. Uh, I do want to step back for a second and offer up our deepest condolences uh, to uh, those who lost loved ones, uh, those who are injured because of this horrific, horrific attack. Uh, we continue to strongly condemn the heinous terrorist attack uh, in Moscow. Uh, and we said this before that, uh, you know, we, uh, in early March, the United States, uh, the gov this government shared information with Russia about a planned terrorist, uh, terror attack in Moscow. We were very clear about that. On March 7th, uh, we actually informed uh, Americans in Russia uh, to, to uh, get, did a public advisory, to be more specific. And, uh, you know, ISIS bears the sole responsibility here. The sole responsibility, and Mr. Putin understands that. We shared that with, the, with their government. And so there is no evidence, absolutely no evidence, that Ukraine was involved here. How did you go about sharing that information? I'm not gonna, through the State Department, U.S. Embassy? I'm, I'm just Embassy. not going to get into specifics. We, the U.S. government, share that uh, with Russian authorities, and I'll just leave it there. And what do you make of Russia's decision not to act on that warning? That's something for that's for Russian authorities to speak to their own uh, security operations. That's for them to speak to. Uh, you know, when we have imminent imminent we have information about imminent uh, threat to civilian populations, we provide that information to the respective authorities, uh, and that's what we did. We did that in early March. It is up to Russian authorities to speak to what they do with that inf what they did with this particular information that we provided early March. Okay. Thanks, Green. Um, I wanted to ask you about. Um, former RNC chair Ronna McDaniel being hired by NBC News, given that this is a White House that has condemned lies about January 6th, condemned lies about the 2020 election, what do you make of uh, the network hiring somebody who participated in a phone call, um, you know, pressuring Michigan officials to not certify certain votes? So look, we're gonna we're always very mindful about personal decisions. Uh, in this in this instance, made by uh, a media organization, I'll say a couple of things, and I'll quote the president in a second. So, you are, you all heard him at the gridiron uh, dinner very recently, about two weekends ago. He spoke directly about critical role that journalists play. Uh, and, and they have in protecting our democracy by making sure that the public knows the truth, that the public knows the facts. And what he said is, we need you, democracy is at risk, and the American people need to know, in fractured times, they need a context and a perspective. They need substance to match the enormity of the task. It is a big task that journalists have, and we understand that. And the facts and the truth are critical here. I'm not going to make any comments on that person on a personnel decision, but as more broadly speaking, uh, it is uh, it is important. It is it is a burden on all of us here, right, to be really mindful about that and that the public understands what the facts are and what the truth is. Well, you're, so you're quoting the president talking about that kind of burden. Um, I mean, do you? Does this White House? Does the president believe that that? Um, kind of voice 
that voice like hers, that there's room for her in the national political discourse? I mean, look, I'll, I'll say, I'll answer it this way. We saw what happened on January 6th. We saw what happened when 2,000 people, mob, went to the Capitol and undermined uh, our democracy, attacked our democracy, because they didn't believe in free and fair elections. And so we understand, and we saw that, and you, some of you may have been there, some, all, many of you reported it. Uh, and it was an attack on our democracy. And it is important, it is important that we are very clear to the public about the facts, that we are very clear to the public about the truth. And we understand the burden that you all have. Uh, and, uh, and so I just want to be super mindful, not commenting on a personal decision, but more broadly speaking, that is where we are. That is where we are as a country. Uh, Kareem, Senator Tim Kaine said yesterday that, uh, talking about immigration and executive orders, he said Congress should act, but he also says where the president can act, mm -hmm. um, he should. Is the president receptive to this type of advocacy from senior members of his own party on this issue? I mean, look, the senior uh, senator, you're speaking about a senator, bipartisan agreement that came out of the Senate to deal with, the, to deal with immigration, to deal with immigration policy and the challenges at the border. There was a bipartisan agreement that if it went into life, if it gone through the process of the Senate in the in the House and and the president got it to got it to the to his desk and signed it, it would have been the toughest and fairest, uh, you know, action on immigration in decades, in years. And so that is what the president continues to speak to. We believe that is the direction to go. That is the way that we can stand on some legal ground here and we know that it was done in a bipartisan way to move it forward. And so that's what this president wants to see. Obviously, we're in constant conversation, communication uh, with uh, leadership in Congress. That is something that we do pretty regularly. But there is a deal. There was a deal that was made. And the last former president, the last president, President Trump, said to Republicans, uh, some, of you rep oh, some of you reported this, to reject that deal because it would hurt him politically. And that's not what we're about here. What the president wants to focus on is what Americans care about. And majority of Americans care about what's happening at the border. And we took a step to do that. We took a step. The president, along with Republicans in the Senate, Democrats in the Senate, took a step to actually deal with this issue. We've been very clear about executive actions. Will we look at executive actions to see what could work? Sure, we always do that. But here's the thing, what we understand the bottom line is that we have to move forward with legislative action to actually make a difference here. And that's what we want to see. Executive action won't do it. It won't have the impact that this bipartisan uh, uh, agreement, negotiation, that came to, to fruition. Do you have any expectation, though, that Congress is going to act? That, that deal's been out there for a while. Congress is out for the next couple of weeks. The former president is against it. His party's now against I it. Hear I, mean, I, I hear you. I hear you. But in that case, I mean, Congress you know, often doesn't deliver what you guys want. Isn't that where then the White House look, steps in? I, look, I hear you. So look, we were able to get some additional funding for border security operations through the, uh, through the budget uh, agreement. So that was a good thing, but we need to take a step further. And so look, we're gonna continue to doing the work. We're gonna continue to have those conversations and we're gonna continue to be very, very clear, take it directly to the American people. You saw the president do when he went to Texas, Brownsville, Texas, and be very clear on where we stand. The split screen that day could not have been more clear about where the president stands and what he wants to do. And he has offered, continues to offer an olive branch to the other side to get this done. If, you, if they truly care about this, there's a way to do this. There's a way to meet, where, meet, meet the American people where they are, majority of them, is to move forward with that border, border deal. That's the way to move forward here. Okay, President Biden has recently talked about Donald Trump's financial uh, issues, ingested fundraisers and so forth. Today there was action reducing the amount that uh, Mr. Trump has to put forward in order to stave off the uh, judgment as he continues. Does the President have any comment on that and also the setting of an April 15th uh, trial date uh, in one of the cases involving the farmers. So I'm going to be super careful. It's an ongoing matter, so I'm not going to uh, speak to it. And I'm sure the president will have opportunities to speak to it himself. And so I'll leave that to him. I'm just not going to speak for, to, to that particular or any ongoing litigation or case uh, from the podium. Can I ask a bit about whether you can share any preview ahead of the Japanese prime minister visit on April 10th? And in particular, 
Has the government been in touch with the Japanese government on the Nippon Steel U.S. Steel deal, or has that been not a subject that preceded this visit? Mm -hmm. uh, so, look, I don't have. I've seen the reporting. This is the the, the FT reporting that you're speaking to, or well, that, that's linked to it. That there'll yeah. be some sort of that, uh, whatever you can share on that is great too. Yeah. But I mean, more broadly, have yeah. have, uh, have the governments discussed this steel deal? At all? So uh, I just don't have anything to, to share. Obviously, that uh, that visit is is is. is is just in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll certainly, there's gonna be many items uh, on the agenda to discuss. I just don't have anything to share on that particular question. Okay, thank you. Great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. At the end of the week, it will be one year that Evan Gashkovich was detained. Yeah. Is there any update on the negotiations? I, I wish I, I had one for you. I really do. I wish I had an update on um, Evan. I wish I had an update on Paul. Uh, as you know, we have been really focus on getting them uh, released, and we have been, uh, it is a priority for this president. Uh, I just don't have anything to share at this time. All right, guys, I have to go. Um, go ahead, Emily. Thanks, Green. I just wanted to check in to see if the president or first lady reached out to the British royal family. I know cancer is a personal issue to yeah. them, and did they call or write a letter? Or so I, I think you saw the president's tweet. Uh, is it a tweet now? Whatever it is. Post post, the President's post, um, uh, obviously our, our hearts go out uh, to, uh, uh, to Princess Kate and, and her family. We understand it's a difficult time. Uh, as you know, this is something that the, uh, the President and the First Lady understand very personally. I don't have a call to read out to you, uh, but certainly we uh, wish her um, a full recovery and our hearts, our hearts and thoughts are, are with her and her family. And during this very difficult time, as you know, she has little children, uh, and I cannot even, do not want to even imagine uh, what they're going through right now. With that, folks, we'll see you. We'll see you on the road tomorrow. Thanks, everybody.